Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes, I'm about to use a big word, sometimes there seems to be a dichotomy in the Bible. A dichotomy is just a, it's a fancy word to describe, describe something that seems like it's contradicting. Sometimes it seems like people will say, oh, the scripture's contradicting. No, no, my friend. God's word never contradicts itself. God never contradicts himself. If you think you see a contradiction, that means you're supposed to dig deeper to try to find out what the Lord is speaking. Amen. And so sometimes there seems to be a contradiction within the teachings of scripture. He said this, but then he turns around and he says that. And so here's an example. Unless you are converted and become as one of these little children. You're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Give me a little chance to try to build upon this. But what do you think he means by that? I know he said, unless you become humble, he, he used the word humble. But what does he want? Does he want adults to literally become children? No. The child is the illustration. A believer is supposed to behave like a child in some way, shape or form, whenever they're conducting kingdom business. I'm going to talk to you a lot about the kingdom this morning. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. You do understand that the kingdom of God is something that is completely different than the kingdoms of the world that we're living within the midst of. And that it's very difficult if we don't understand what's written in the word of God to be able to sometimes determine the difference between the two. And then if we're not born again, listen, I want to tell you, I've said it once already this morning, and I'm going to say it again. And uh, if we're not born again, we cannot even see the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus, the religious leader in John 3. He said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. The natural mind. And I don't care how smart you are. And part of what he's talking about is that unless you become converted and be like one of these children, you can't enter. And then he goes on to say this. And the context is this. Who will be the greatest in your kingdom, Lord? If you go back and you read all of the stories of the disciples that come in there, and this is this is the sons of thunder. This is uh, John and and James. No, John and yeah, John and James, right? Yeah. John and James, sons of thunder and the sons of Zebedee, and they come there with their mom in one of the gospels, and she asks, and then they also ask, "Who's going to be able to sit at your right hand?" And he's like, "Can you drink the cup that I will drink?" Okay, and, and then and so they're wanting the position, they're wanting a place. In the kingdom, and what Jesus is going to constantly tell you is that the kingdom of God works different than the kingdom of the world. Because he that is least in the kingdom will be the greatest. Yes. Yes. The, the Gentiles lord over. They want to be the managers. They want to be the masters. Religion wants to be the master. Religion says they take pride sitting in Moses' seat. They want the highest seat in the house. They so full of pride, but the Lord says, don't you do that. Instead, humble yourself. And that's part of what the Lord's talking about. Let you become converted. The word in the Strong's means turn around to twist or change direction. The Oxford American Dictionary says that it's been adapted to be suitable for a new purpose. Here's a definition. The house was converted into a duplex. Completely different purpose. It used to be a single family dwelling. Now it's turned into a duplex. And now it's a money maker. Now it's for multiple families. And the word of the Lord says, and then a house was converted. And you, Christian, must be converted to a child. For a day, because you're for a different purpose now. The first time you were born of your mother, you were born in Adam. That's what the Bible teaches. You were born in Adam. You gushed forth in water from your mother's womb, and you engaged in a natural birth. But the word of the Lord says, man must be born again. And when you get born again, hallelujah, a miracle takes place on the inside of your life. And now, now we must learn how to be converted to a child. 
Meaning in our life, we must learn how to be converted to a child. So what do you reckon he's talking about? Learning how to live in his kingdom now so we can enter his kingdom then. What attribute of a child would you say Jesus wants from his believers? What is it about a child that Jesus wants his followers to emulate? I believe the simple answer is said and humble, but what? What about faith and trust? What about dependence? I can't get them cookies, mama. They're too high up in the cabinet. I need you, mommy. He's our little daughter. He's just like, she says, I need you, mommy. Oh. And we turn around and say, we need you. Right? I, I need you, mom. And so dependence of the child upon the parent. And the Lord wants you and I to understand. For us to be dependent upon him. Not independent of him, but dependent upon him, trusting in him, not fixing our own situations and circumstances when we have our own resources to do such a thing, but instead humbling ourselves under the hand of God, following according to a scripture, waiting on him, patiently waiting on him, seeking his face and waiting on his answer, not taking things into our own matters and making things happen. Amen. Amen. So we take that and 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 then now let's that was just the first illustration converted like a child, because I'm talking about sometimes the word of God seems like it contradicts itself. That's the first part. Humble yourself like a child and be dependent upon the Lord. All right. Now let's compare that to this. Proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cast out devils, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. What I say to you in the dark, tell it in the light. What you hear whispered in the ear, proclaim it from the rooftops. Doesn't sound like a little child right there. Sounds like a mighty warrior, a man of God, filled with the power of God, given a de declaration by the king himself and saying, I need you to take this kingdom that has been placed on the inside of you and I need you to bring it to those that are lost and hurting out there in the world. The word pro proclaim right there is, talks about a public crier, a herald of the king's declaration. Father, in the name of Jesus, help me teach or preach this message, prayers of paupers and declarations of a king. Let's talk about the king. Let's, let's talk about the kingdom and how it ended. There it says in Matthew 27, you don't have to move there. But look, they had stripped him. They put him in a scarlet robe. They braided together a crown of thorns and thrust it upon his head. And what kind of king do you propose this is? One time I thought about this. I was listening to a song many, many years ago. And I was like, what kind of king are you? Who's ever heard of such a thing that a king would die for his citizens? What? It makes no sense. He bears the curse of mankind upon his head. At the garden when they fell, the word of God says, cursed will be the ground for you. Thorns and thistles it will produce. Your king bears your curse upon his head. He's not the one that cursed the ground. He came to reverse the curse. He came to bring hope, to bring health, and to bring life. Yes. There he is. He's stripped. He's in the scarlet robe. Look, in the beginning of the ministry, here comes John the Baptist. Preaching, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Hallelujah. In the spirit of Elijah, prepare you the way of the Lord. And I love this. It says the same John had as his raiment camel's hair, a leather belt. His food was locusts and honey. Wow. What an image. All the, all the religious clean folk are over there in the city listening to the Pharisees and the Sadducees walking around with holy boxes on their head, long flowing robes, and here's John the Baptist wearing camel's hair out in the wilderness, locust legs hanging off his beard, proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent! And when the religious come out there to see, because look, the, the, the Lord done pulled all the people out of the synagogue and brought them out to the wilderness. So now their churches are empty. And they're like, wait, we got to go see what the baptizers are doing out there. And you know what he tells them? He said, who told you to come out here, you brood of vipers? Right. Who told you to come? Because you see, religion, the spirit.
spirit of religion is against the moving and operation of what God wants to do. God wants to move in and he wants to cause a change on the inside of your heart, on the inside of my heart. He doesn't want to coexist with religion. He doesn't want to coexist with the kingdoms of the world. He doesn't want to get a part-time relationship out of you or out of me. He wants everything. He gave everything and he wants everything. Well, I can't give him everything. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to you? The best version of you is going to come to pass. Because God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. You will not lay down everything for the cause of Christ and not, he will not restore it unto you. The word of God says it, not only in the next life, but in this life here right now. To come. Sometimes we cling so tightly. We cling so tightly. I'm preaching to the preacher. We cling so tight. No, we need to learn how to li release those things that are damaging us. What are they? That's between you and the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus comes preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then... And he's come preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. I'm telling you, I'm starting to believe it more and more. I've been believing it since I first got saved and went to that church in, Twin, at, in Berwick, Louisiana, where they used to have a bumper sticker. And you know what? It's probably, it, listen, when you think about John the Baptist wearing camel's hair and locusts coming off his beard, you reckon that most people in the church today want to go chill with John? No, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to act like we got something figured out. I'm just trying to be real with you. The more you give your life to Christ, the more you're willing to talk about him, do you realize you're going to run into some people that are going to roll their eyes at you? Oh, Lord, help me. I can't even handle somebody rolling their eyes at me. Jesus was, his back was thrashed. And Paul got his head cut off after being in the Mamertine prison. And now I'm going to get my little feelings hurt and somebody rolls their eyes at me. Like, I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just trying to ask you a question. Right? But anyway, so not many people probably want to go to this church, but for a little period of time, dude, it was packed to the gill. And I mean, dude, they had tambourines. They were running around. And you know what her bumper sticker said? Twin City Gospel Temple, where people are crazy for Jesus. <laughs> Had like crazy written all shaky like that, where people are crazy for Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to be crazy for Jesus. I don't want to be full of pomp and circumstance. Amen. I mean, I want to know how to act in the right place at the right time. I want to be all things to all people. I want to be led by the spirit of the Lord. Amen. But I want to be real. Praise God. And so, look, he starts to speak now about the kingdom the, on the mountain uh, beatitude on the uh, on the mount of uh, when he preaches the, the beatitude. You know what I'm talking about? Chapter five, Matthew chapter five. Listen, I'm about to write this on here. Danielle, if I get this right, if I don't get it right, let me know. www. What is it? Agna Ao dash Bible study. All one word. And then what? Dot com? Yeah. All right. There you go. That's our website. We don't really use it much anymore, but she's been downloading all the notes on there. I'm not asking you to read the notes. That's completely up to you. I don't know how busy your life is. You might have your own Bible study stuff going on. My only point to that is this, is that there may be some people out there that would want to read the notes. And this is the thing. I want you to see that what I'm telling you today ain't nothing but almost pure D scripture. Everything that I'm preaching to you from, I'm, the w different words are coming out of my mouth. But if I sat here and just read it, it would be almost like nothing but scripture on the page. I'm trying to make a point to you that it's written in the word of God what the kingdom of God looks like. The problem is, is that we've got people sitting in churches all across America and they're listening to preachers and they're sitting in big old churches that are filled to the gills with people. And the preacher refuses to tell the truth. Listen to me. I'm not trying to tell you that there ain't no big churches where they don't have preachers preaching the truth. That is not what I'm saying. So don't put words in my mouth. But what I am trying to say is this, is that there's a whole lot of preachers saying a whole lot of things and refusing to talk about sin and refusing to talk about the truth of God's word. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that are sitting in churches that feel that they, and they feel comfortable because the music made them feel calm and, 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 and the preacher, they trusted what the preacher said, but they never read the Bible for themselves. And then they're going to stand before God. I've been praying for preachers. Because I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit made that so real to my heart about me. And I, I try. I try to pay attention to what this word says. But he rebuked me. 
You can hold that against me if you want to. It'd be like the next time we get into a discussion and you don't like what I'm saying, people do that to me all the time. And it's okay, you can do that. But I'm, here, I'm only doing it out of humility to let you try to be humble to let you know this is serious business. The, the church needs to, we need to wake up. You need to wake up, child of God. Listen, the, 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 the word of God says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We need to get our heart right. We need to understand what the word of the Lord says. God has given us what it is that we need to walk in kingdom authority, to walk in kingdom victory in the name of Jesus. Let us begin to walk in the victory that Jesus has won for us. Amen. Amen. So now he's gone and he's preaching the gospel. Miracles are following him. Then he starts to speak on the mountain and he preaches the message of the Beatitudes. Okay. The first thing he says is this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but he says this. Blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, a poor man, that's where I get part of this title, is called, you can call it a pauper. A poor man is a pauper and he's without resources. The weaker we are, the stronger he is. The weaker we are, the stronger the spirit in us is. The more we die, the more he lives. Amen. A spiritual pauper is like a child. He is dependent upon another. Jesus said, suffer not the little children. Yeah. I don't want to be a pauper. I don't want to be poor in spirit. But listen, the poor are lowly, they're afflicted, they're helpless, they're powerless. They cannot accomplish what God is asking them to do. The citizens of the Lord's kingdom are expected to come to the conclusion that this kingdom operates differently. This is not the American dream. The strength is not we the people. The strength and the power is the Holy Spirit working through his people. Please don't put words in my mouth. I believe God allowed this great country to be created. I am so thankful that I'm an American citizen. I believe God wants this to be a strong country. Hallelujah. But you, Jesus, wasn't an American. And yes, you're blessed to have been born an American. Yes, you want the American uh, freedoms and liberties that have been given to you to continue to be able to, for you to be able to walk in them and live in them. But listen to me, that's not how you can, op you can't operate that way in, in kingdom business. Donald Trump might be able to build a big old empire handling his business that way. But if he wants to walk in the ways of the Lord, he's going to have to change some stuff. About at least between him and the Lord. If you want to walk in kingdom authority and anointing, you're going to have to change some things. You're going to have to let the Lord move and operate in your life. And what do you want your testimony to be at the end? I had Trump Plaza. I'm not picking on Donald Trump. That's not my point. I had a golf course in Scotland. It was a beautiful property. Or do you want to stand before the Lord and him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in small things. Now enter into your rest. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. The, the next thing he says is blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. You know, mourning means to feel deep sorrow or regret. I was thinking I put a little prayer in here. Lord, I am sorrowful that man has rebelled against you, Lord. I'm sorrowful that so many churches and so many leaders have not taken heed to your word. That we, your people, have fallen asleep and not stayed spiritually sober. Wake us up, Lord. Cause our hearts to mourn with you over this lost generation. Over the souls that are perishing. Over the people that are hurting out there. Over people's lives where they're their marriages are being destroyed what people are bound by pornography what people are bound by sin of all different sorts Lord we mourn because they're in bondage to the devil's work and Lord you're mourning you're mourning over the world that is rejecting your word and the world that is going headlong and you warn in your word in chapter 7 of Matthew that broad is the way wide is the gate and that many will be brought to destruction. Lord, your mourning cause us, your people, to mourn with you. The kingdom of heaven is like that. 
Jesus was humble and bold. His people are called to be the same way. Both of these traits will make God's people look different than the world around them. When, you know, I was listening to a preacher just recently, and he was like, I mean, does that sound humble to you that Jesus said, I'm the son of God? Yes. Yeah, because it's the truth. Yes. But he didn't say it cocky. He didn't walk around like, I'm a child of God. Like, sassy about it. I, I need help. <laughs> help us, Lord. <laughs> but, he, but he spoke the truth. You are a child of God. You are a king's kid. Hallelujah. You have the kingdom of God resident on the inside of you. Let me keep moving. Amen. You did. You know, I was thinking about this too. In the pure sense of the word, we all have an apostolic calling on our life. Every last one of us. I believe that. I didn't say we're all apostles. I said we all have an apostolic calling on our life. What I mean by that is this. According to the strict definition, the term of an apostle is a sent one. Another part of the definition is that it's an ambassador. You know, ambassadors are representatives of another nation as they live in a foreign land. The American ambassador to Italy lives in Italy, but represents and conducts American business on that foreign soil. An ambassador for the kingdom of Christ lives on earth, but represents the heavenly. Yes. Yes. We are an ambassador yes. for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. At, yes. at Doc's office, you're an ambassador. At the restaurant. As the kingdom of God lives in you, on the workplace, in the field, at the business, hallelujah, you are an ambassador wherever the Lord brings you in the field, welding, fitting, praise God, you're an ambassador, you represent the kingdom of God. Thank you, Jesus. In Matthew 5, 5, he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek means to have a mildness of disposition. Gentleness of spirit, meekness. You know, many times if we, many times there's uh, there's play times in our life that the Lord would have us to be meek to other humans and individuals. <coughs> that's that's an, like in other words that we would that we would prefer our brothers over ourselves. That we would allow the spirit of humility to have its way in our hearts and our lives. But what I do want you to know is that we definitely every time, all day long, need to have meekness towards God. To be soft in our heart towards the Lord. Yet meekness is a fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.23 says meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Meekness is a fruit of the spirit that can only be produced by the Holy Spirit in your life. There's times in our life that we're going to go through great pain and sorrow. The word of God, Jesus said, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. At all costs, child of God, i got to tell you something. Meekness must be maintained towards your king. When things start to happen in your life and you're going through things, the enemy wants to roll up on the side of you and start whispering in your ear. And he wants to cause you to become, he wants to plant a seed of bitterness in your heart. And you'll sit here and you'll start thinking that it's the people you're around and it's all their fault. And unfortunately, they're really just using being used as an agent of the agent of the enemy because you don't even war against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers against world rulers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. But yet at the same time, you will allow. Don't tell me that you didn't because we all done it. You will allow bitterness to enter your heart towards that human being. And before you know it, it's going to throw you off in your relationship with the Lord. Amen. Next thing you know, you'll start blaming God. If you are not careful, child of God, I've seen people walk away from the faith because they blame the God for their situation and their circumstances. A root of bitterness festered on the inside of their heart and caused them to turn away from God. They became so angry because things weren't going the way that they wanted it to go. But if we keep our heart meek towards the Lord, a meek and a humble disposition towards God. He says in Hebrews, he says this, despise not the chastening of the Lord because the Lord chastens those whom he loves. Sometimes we need chastening, right? Am I the only one that needs chastening sometimes in this place? Am I the only one that needs a good little spanking from my daddy every now and then? No, I don't think I am. We all need it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 6 says this, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Isn't that good? 
Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, in the Corinthian letter, he says this, because listen, this verse, I'm not even reading the whole thing, but I felt like the Lord gave me this passage of scripture recently, and it's going to show up in one of my messages, but I'm not even giving you the whole thing. I'm just reading the first part. This is the easy part. So Jesus said, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Paul said, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Listen to me, child of God. The unrighteous shall not. And he, he lists all various sins right there. You can go back and you can read it. I'll preach it soon. He lists all various sins. You're sitting there in a fornicated relationship. You're sitting there committing adultery. And persisting in that lifestyle. You're consistently living in that lifestyle. Uh, and, and, and refusing to repent. And, and, and Lord help you. Lord help me. If we find ourselves in there. Liars. Liars will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Is what he said. You cannot persist in a lifestyle of sin like that. And make it into the kingdom of heaven. John said that he who continues in sin. Is not a child of God. The Lord wants to deal with our hearts, Christian. He wants to do a work on the inside. He is not okay with us acting like it's fine. That, oh no, I'm justified by faith. You've heard me tell the story. I'm fine, I'm justified by faith. No, 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 you better mix your justification with some fear and trembling. We, better, we need to get this right. We only got one chance at this. Now, I mean, we got multiple chances with the Lord, but what I'm saying is when we breathe our last breath here, we're going to face Him. Amen? Praise God. What are we hungry for? Now, he said, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. What are we thirsty for? In life, what do you crave? I'm just asking you a question. I'm not asking you to throw your hand up there and say it. Maybe I'm asking some of you that might end up watching on video. What is it that you crave in life? What is it that you think about? What is it that you think about you know, throughout your life? Now, put one thing in here. Is your appetite that your son or daughter make the travel ball team? That's just one thing. No, I mean, it's something to think about. I didn't say that your son or daughter can't play travel ball. Don't put words in the preacher's mouth. I didn't say that. But I will tell you this. One of the things that I've learned about travel ball, and everybody thinks that their kid is going to be a college baseball player or a college softball player, and they're not all going to make it. But if you make the travel ball team, you know what's going to happen. Your weekends are going to be spent out of town in a hotel room. So that means you will probably not be in the house of the Lord on Sundays. And you'll probably be too tired on Wednesday as you're recovering from the trip to make it into the house of the Lord on Wednesday. I'm trying to make a point here. What I'm telling you is the truth. If you're so hungry for your kids to be in extracurricular activities that they keep you out of doing kingdom business. And listen to me, forsaking the gathering of the brethren is a direct rebellion against the word of God. You and I are supposed to be in the house of God. And, and oh, you just want me to come to your church. Well, yeah, I want you to come to my church. I don't want you to go to somebody else's church. But I will tell you this. I'd rather you go to somebody else's church than not be in any church. That's right. And you might be in somebody else's church and they may not be preaching the truth. That's between you and the Holy Ghost. Amen. But you're supposed to be in the church because if you're not in the church, then that means that you're being rebellious to the word of the Lord, not Pastor Matt. So what are we hungry for? What are we craving? What are we thirsty for? What is it that our mind is on? Is it to be prosperous? Are we so consumed with our jobs and our businesses that we can't even really hardly do the things that God is calling us to do because we're being ripped in a million different directions? It's a good question. Oh, you know, listen, I mean, we got a couple business owners in here. And I mean, this ain't throwing no shade at no business owners. This is just telling the truth. But I got a business to run. Yeah. If the Lord gave you a business, hallelujah, you got a business to run and you need to take care of your business. But you can't, and I'm not talking to the ones that are in here. Well, well, if it's the Holy Spirit talking to you, good, then you just take it for yourself. But if it's not, then, then don't get offended. Okay, but you can't, listen. You know what, my phone, my phone is off right now. You know why my phone is off? Because I don't need to be getting a phone call right now. Well, I can't miss a phone call. What am I, are you off or not? Now listen, if you're on call for your business, listen, I don't even know if I'm even supposed to be saying all this. But I will say this, we should be able to give the Lord 
Yes. Sometime. That's right. Amen. Yes. Sometime. Hallelujah. If you miss work because you're on call, well, I mean, if you miss church because you're on call, that makes sense. You're on call. You got an obligation. Your bosses are paying you to go to church. He's paying you to work. I get all of that. But if we give our time and our efforts unto the Lord, do we not think that he will bless the work that we're here? That, that, you know what I'm saying? Do you not think that he will bless the rest of what it is that we were doing? Jesus was hungry to do his father's will. Those that are citizens of his kingdom hunger and thirst for what their king desires. He desires that this wicked world be made right. The citizens of this kingdom are called to live in a different realm. They are called to seek the things that are above. Listen, all of the letters of the apostles repeatedly remind the saints to keep their eyes and their minds on the things of God. The more we study, the more it becomes clear that this world is not our home. Peter said that, did he not? He said that you're strangers and you're pilgrims. So if you're a stranger and you're a pilgrim, he implores us, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your soul. I got to be careful because I'm in mixed company of different ages. But if I'm sitting there engaging in internet pornography and doing all the things that are interconnected to that, that is a fleshly lust that is warring against my soul. You know what the word of God says in one of the new apostolic letters, I'm pretty sure Peter wrote it, uh, about, about Lot. You know what it says in, in there? It says that Lot vexed his own righteous soul. Every day that Lot woke up a little bit closer to Sodom, he was bringing a vexation on his own soul. Till finally he wakes up one day and his house is within the city perimeter. Listen to me, child of God. You cannot continue to walk towards the things of the world. You cannot sit there. Oh, but I work in the world. That's not what I'm talking about. The Lord will give you the grace and the strength that you need in order to be light in the midst of darkness. I'm talking about you in living in the world and acting like we're okay with the we're in the kingdom of God. No, you 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 can you must abstain from fleshly lusts. Well, how do I do it? Jesus already died on the cross to bring you freedom. It's a completed work. Jesus says that it's finished. And whenever he died, he paid the sin debt. Hallelujah. Sin had no right to hold him down. He resurrected from the grave. And all power, all authority has been given unto him. And now the Holy Spirit is at your access. And the Holy Spirit wants to work in you. And he wants to work through you. And he wants to strengthen you to give you victory so that you can abstain. From fleshly lusts that war against your soul. And sometimes it's not even, sometimes it's not even, oh, but it ain't that bad. Okay, well, here we go with the whole bitterness thing again. Here we go with the whole bad attitude thing again. Here we go with the gossip spirit again. Here we go with this again. Here we go with that again. All of those things that are in contradistinction to the word of God are messing up your walk with God. Messing up my walk with God. Because if you think the preacher's perfect, you came to the wrong church. But if I'm going to preach it to you, i got to preach it to myself. Amen? Amen? The Lord wants to do a work in us. Hallelujah. Amen. Look, Paul said this in Colossians. He said, if you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes it's about motive. I mean, going back to the work thing, going back <laughs> to the business thing. You can, it's possible, and I'm not speaking for anybody else, I'm speaking for myself. It's possible that God's hand of blessing can be poured upon your life because, he lo because God is a blessing God. And the next thing you know, that thing turns into a whole different animal that God never intended it for it to be. I'm just being honest with you. I have seen times in my life that God has blessed me so much financially, but that thing turned into a whole other animal. It started to consume everything about me to the point where I didn't have time for anything else but that. It, like, you know what I'm saying? But how do you get all that done? I got it all done, but I wasn't really praying during that time. And I was a pastor of a church. Oh, I know y'all going to probably throw that one back on me sooner or later. Somebody somewhere will, and it's okay. I give you permission. I was, how you did that, dude? How you had three nurse practitioner jobs and sold roofs like that 
two days a week and made all that money in that one year like that. How you did that, bro? I said, man, the Lord just, the Lord just does that. I, I just, I can multitask. There's some truth to that. But guess what? Other things were being, other things were being neglected. And that's what I'm trying to say. God wants to bless us if he can trust us and what we're supposed to be doing is supposed to. Listen, the kingdom of God is different. He's not making millionaires just so you can be fat and sassy and be a millionaire. No, he's not. Not if you belong to him. You should put your finances, your resources, everything that he's given you are supposed to be poured back into the kingdom of God. Amen. That's just the word of God. Uh, and then hopefully people that have been around long enough know that. I know, I know what the Lord has shown me in the word of God. Your time and your resources. I'm not over here preaching to, to novices. I'm, I'm telling you the word of the Lord. You, you, if you belong to him, if you are a child of the king, and, and then your life is supposed to bring him glory in every way, shape, or fashion, if you believe this. If you believe that there's a hurting world out there that's dying, that need to hear Jesus, then we are to come together. Our time together in prayer, believing God that he will give us souls. Our resources, our finances, our time. If we got to go knock out some walls, please come help. If not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to be there. We're going to do, do this. We're going to have to do this together. Amen? Yeah. Uh, hallelujah. And so, that, so that we can provide something yeah. for the young people. Yes. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We're working on it. Be patient. Amen. Paul says in Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already come, but he's coming again. I'm telling you, it's going to be a sad day if we lived our whole life for the here and now. Paul said it. He said, if this is all we got, this is pitiable. <laughs> yeah. I don't even think we use that word anymore in the English. Because that's probably, he said something in the Greek. If this is all we have to live for, this is pitiable. There is more to life on the other side of the veil, my friend. I hope you believe that. The kingdom of darkness has power and is destroying people's lives. And Jesus came to give his power to his people so that they could combat. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says this. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. If you've ever heard me say this before, you might not have even liked it when I said it. When I say this whole world is under a satanic curse. I've said that before. It might have bothered you. Maybe I'm not saying it did bother you, but it might have bothered you when I said that. Okay, well, do you have a problem with John? 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The world lies in the power of Satan. But hallelujah, you don't lie in the power of Satan. Hallelujah, you don't live in that kingdom. The word of God says in Colossians 1.13 that he's delivered us. I like the way the NASB says it. He delivered us from the dominion of darkness and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. You and I no longer, the first time you were born of Adam, yes, you were born in this wicked world under the bondage of Satan. But when you got born again, when you received Christ into your heart, you were translated from one kingdom to another kingdom. And the very spirit of God, the one who resurrected Jesus from the dead, lives on the inside of you now. Listen, the demons trembled. I love that scripture out of Matthew 8, 29. He said, the, Jesus shows up and the men of Gadarene are there. There was two of them in one of the stories. He says, what have we to do with you, Jesus, son of God? Are you come to torment us before the time? Yep. <laughs> sure have. Serving notice on you. Serving notice on you that your time is limited. And guess what? That same spirit that lived in him lived in you and me. Praise God, you and I have authority over that. Yeah. I've been living in authority over the demonic realm, listen, in certain ways that I didn't even know. I didn't even know I had that authority. What I'm trying to talk about is this. Whenever the Lord puts a call on your life, whenever you give your heart to Christ, whenever you get born again, the power that is on the inside of you, you're just walking in the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit and demonic activity cannot overwhelm you. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. 
and not just in and of itself, but you can take it even further. There's people that are bound. You can lay hands on them and believe God to deliver them from the bondage of that evil. They don't have to continue to live that way. Yes. Hallelujah. The people of his kingdom are called to be humble and meek, but they are also called to walk in his kingdom authority. Jesus said it in Matthew 28. He said, go into all the world. He said, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said, went on to say this in Matthew 10. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. You know, the Lord's kingdom, scholars say this, it's already but not yet. What does that mean? It means this. Jesus has already come to earth with the authority of heaven. And he's taken the authority that Satan snatched from Adam. And he's now destroyed that power through his death on the cross, paying the, the sin debt. And he's resurrected to newness of life. He's established his kingdom on earth. One day he will rule and reign physically on the throne of David in the future. But right now he is ruling and reigning through you and he's ruling and reigning Amen. through me. Amen. If you and I are not walking in our kingdom authority, if you and I are not walking in what Christ died that we could walk in so that that anointing can flow through our lives so that we can bring Jesus. Listen, if you've you got to be born again first. Once you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, as you begin to seek the face of God, as you begin to pray and the anointing gets stronger, he will bring you in someone's path. And as you speak to them, the word of life will enter into their heart and it'll be like a seed that can produce a harvest in their life. Amen? It's all ready, but it's not yet. Jesus told the Pharisees, they were questioning him. He said to the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the NASB says, behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. But in the kingdom, in the King James Version, he says, the kingdom of God is within you. Right. Whenever you get saved, the spirit of God lives in you. The kingdom of God is in you. Amen. The power and the authority of the kingdom of God is in you. Amen. And wherever you go and whatever you do, the power of heaven is there at your disposal to use you. It's not just about the preacher when he gets up behind the pulpit. It's about you and I walking out of these walls, out of these doors, and letting God use us. It's about the musicians. I believe that God's going to give us opportunities to go outside of these walls. People with gifts to be used, your anointing that you have. Amen? Amen. You're anointing as a musician. You're anointing as an intercessor. You're anointing to pray over the sick and to see them recover. You're anointing to see people's lives no longer under the bondage of evil. Amen. He is the kingdom. The king is in us. The kingdom of all its, and all of its power and authority is in us. He said this in Revelation 5 and 10. He called us to be kings and priests. Yes. There's a day when we are going to literally rule and reign. I believe that. If it's too much for you to handle, came to the wrong church, but <laughs> I don't know what else to say. The Bible says that there's coming a day in the millennial reign of Christ that we will rule and reign with him like a king and a priest on the earth. And guess what? He's given us a down payment. He's given us a down payment. We are to walk in that anointing today. I'm closing with a couple of things. First off, I want you to know, I want to just share with you some submissive prayers that were prayed. Well, really, yeah, by, by a king. Okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, I'm going to read to you one prayer because that's a prayer of a pauper, right? He, he he doesn't have his own strength. He's he's full of sorrow. You know, King David went through times in his life when when the whole world was against him. I mean, really. I mean, if you read the story of King David's life. The whole, there were many times the whole world was against him. His kingdom was against him. His son was against him. He was hiding in caves. Saul wanted to kill him. There was a lot of turmoil in his life. And sometimes there's turmoil and chaos in our lives. The Lord said that it's going to happen. Okay, but guess what? He said, be of good cheer for he had overcome the world. You and I can receive. And you know one of the things I've learned is sometimes when my heart is heavy, whether it's because of my, you know, my daughter or something else going on. 
if I feel some, you know, heaviness because things, maybe I feel like things are going on in the church, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and I feel a heaviness. One of the things that I've noticed is this. If I'll talk about it less and pray about it more, especially like when I come back, if I've had a rough day at the job, fortunately, those days are going to be coming less and less. But one of the things, a rough day at the job plus other things happening in life, and it's like you just feel like the spirit of heaviness is trying to grab a hold of you, right? And the whole time I'm driving, I'll be like, Lord, I'm ready. Lord, I'm excited. And, I'm, and you know, it's about, be about one o'clock in the morning when I get to this place, but I'll walk in sometimes. <laughs> and I just open the door in the presence of the Lord. It just starts to fall. And I just begin to cry out to the King of Kings. And his anointing ministers to my heart. And he starts to give me strength. And he starts to reassure me. You just keep trusting in me, son. The way that the world might try to get on your back. And listen, he's it, it, going to try to get on you too. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. You have to find time to get alone with him. It is so important. We talked about it last week. He tore the veil to give us entrance so that we could enter in. The Lord died and paid a heavy price so that you and I could spend time with him. We should spend time with him. Amen? All right, so I want to read to you out of, uh, so I'm actually going to read it out of uh, the ESV version right here. The title on, my, on this Bible app says, In the day of trouble, I seek the Lord. David says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. You ever prayed sometimes and you just don't even feel like you're, it's almost like your soul is refusing to be comforted? When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. The King James says my spirit is overwhelmed. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old. Has God ever done anything in your life before? Are there times whenever you feel as though you're not breaking through, you're not getting through? I'm, I tried to pray, preacher. I tried to listen to what you said, but I just couldn't feel his presence. David couldn't feel his presence like he wanted to right now. But you know what he said? I considered the days of old. The years long ago, I said, let me remember my song in the night. Yes. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? In other words, is he going to keep? It seems like sometimes he's kicking me away. It seems like sometimes his long hand is pushing me away. He's giving me a stiff arm. Will he do that forever? Whenever I remember the things of old, my mind says, it's not very likely that he's going to do that. There's a reason that something's going on right here, right now, in this time, when I don't feel like I can break through and get a hold of his presence, I do not believe that he's going to keep me like that forever. Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this to the ears of your right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the people. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. You know, sometimes when we're getting in, trying to get into the presence of God, he seems distant. I want to just encourage you, don't quit. Don't give up. Keep seeking his face. You know, here's the words of Jesus. 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word of the Lord teaches us that when, and listen, it was your sin. It wasn't, he didn't have any sin. It was your sin, my sin, that was placed on Christ on the cross that caused the Father to turn his face. <laughs> he did not feel the presence of the Lord. The one time in his life when he was literally completely alone. Many had rejected him up to this point. His own brothers scoffed and mocked at him. But this is the one time he felt he was completely and utterly alone. I can't prove it, but I wonder. I wonder if he made his mind think back <laughs> to the other day. The times that he had spent in the presence of the Lord. The times that he had remembered that he was with his father and he could feel the power in the presence of God with him, strengthening him. The times that even whenever he sent Moses and Elijah to, to speak to Jesus, the times that he would, maybe he had even read the scripture. Maybe, maybe I can't prove it because it doesn't say it, but maybe even when his eyes lit upon Isaiah chapter uh, 53, and he said like a lamb, he was led to slaughter and he opened out his mouth. Have you ever read the word of God and the Holy Spirit causes the word to jump off the page into your heart? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like you're reading the word of God and all of a sudden it comes alive. Boom, that's for you. Amen. You imagine me and Jesus and read the scroll of Isaiah and read right there like a lamb. He, would, he don't know it yet. He's, listen, he's not God. Yes, he's God. He never stopped being God, but he was fully man. He had to learn what his purpose was on earth. He's not a baby in a manger, goo goo gaga, and he knows all the things that he's going to have to do. He has to learn these things, and he learns these things as he lives and as he's being led by the presence of God, the Spirit of God, and as he's entering into the Word of the Lord. And it's hard for me to believe that when he read Isaiah 53, and it said, as a lamb led to slaughter, he did not open his mouth. He bore our transgressions because of our iniquities. You're going to tell me that that didn't... Look, Whenever he read Psalm 22 and it said, My hands and my feet are pierced. They divide my garments. You're going to tell me that the Holy Spirit didn't say that's you? You're the one. And there he hangs on the cross and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I just have to imagine the times that he had spent with the Father that he drew on that. I want to encourage you. When you're going through things, I want to encourage you to seek God. Not just for the church. I'm, I'm pleading with you that you keep seeking God for the church. That the Holy Spirit would keep moving. Not just because I'm the pastor and I need some bigger church. That's not the point. The point is, is that we can do so much more together as a body to reach the lost. But for yourself, for your family. I've been praying for you. But that you pray for yourself and that we would continue to believe God. And that even when we don't feel His presence, that we would remember the time times yeah. that he's shown up before and I believe that when you do feel it you're going to fill it with might you're going to fill it with power you're going to feel the anointing hallelujah and it's going to change you amen it's going to change me his power amen. is going to work in us amen a little bit further, he fell on his face and he prayed, My father, I'm talking about the prayer of a pauper. I'm talking about that is poor in spirit. As a child, he cries out to his father. My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Hebrews 5, 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. To him who was able to save him from death, he was heard because of his reverence. The King James Version says fear. Jesus feared the Father. He, he reverenced the Father. Did he have a, he had a closer relationship with the Father than any of us? He wanted to do the Father's will. Listen, I want to say this. I really do believe this. I believe that in our church, uh, I believe we still lack I'm not saying this it's a word of correction but I'm saying it with as much love as I can muster up I still feel like we still lack reverence to some extent and what I mean is reverence of the Holy Spirit you gotta understand I'm not trying to control anybody I'm trying to make a point whenever we come together and we're 
what do you expect whenever you come into this church now? I don't know what you expected two years ago. But, and I'm not asking you to answer. But as the Lord's been moving, I hope that when you come into this church now, you're coming with expectancy in your heart. Expecting that the Holy Spirit is going to show up. Yes. And that he is going to move. Yes. Amen. On people's hearts. In your heart. In your life. Then you'll hear the word of God preached and that it will have an effect in your life. Amen? Amen. So we come in with a with a sense of expectancy. Are you, are you coming in expecting that the Holy Spirit is going to change something in your life? Yes. You coming in expecting that God's going to do a miracle? Yes. And that no matter how bad it looks like, are you going to walk back out of the house of God and go right back? Man, I can't believe them people talking about me like that. I can't believe... You know, all of the, just you take your own scenario and you plug it in. When we're coming to the house of the Lord and we're about to start to worship God, now really, I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are, really. I mean, I'm just saying, like young people too, young people too. You're not so young that you can't try. I mean, yes, you can be too young. I mean, it's kind of probably a little bit hard for somebody Mikey's age, but that's okay, Mikey. You just pray your own little prayer there, little buddy. And the Lord's going to touch your heart, brother. He will, too. I'm telling you right now, five, seven years old, some, some people have got, look, people talk about Brother Jimmy fire. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost when he was eight years old. Whatever you think you want to think about a person, I'm telling you right now, there have been men of God that have been touched by the Lord at seven, eight, nine years old. The Holy Spirit showed up and said, get in your room, close the door, and seek me. And when you seek you will find me. And their whole destiny for their life was changed. Yes. An anointing was placed on the inside of their life and their whole life was now the same. You're not too young. You're not too young to let God work in you and to change you. So what I'm trying to say is when we come into the house of God with a sense of expectancy, look, what, what are we doing? Are we still talking in the midst of song service to one another? No, really. I mean, look, it's one thing if you want to talk to each other while I'm preaching. And look, if you're asking, so, come on, man, I'm not trying to be a control freak. Say, hey, where did you see us after turn? Okay, fine. <laughs> but I'm talking about, you know, no, I am so, I love your dress. Dude. That, that dress, you got it going on, girl. You know, or, you know, like whatever. Oh, did you hear what old so-and-so said? And now you legit having a conversation. And here's, Mike up here trying to hit her, or Yvette up here strumming her guitar, and these people are like, oh, I don't know that they look at each other like that, but if I was a singer or musician, I'd be like, can you believe the nerve of these people? <laughs> no, really. Like, I didn't even sleep good last night, got up early this morning, we over here worshiping the Lord, we got to be back here at 2 to practice 15 songs for worship night because pastor came up with it. Hopefully the Holy Spirit gave him the idea. And now, look, you know, I'm not saying, now look at that. Look at they all were there talking to each other. No respect. And it's not even, that's one level of it. That's them. And that's just some earthlings. <laughs> I mean, earthlings are important in the eyes of God. But what about the Holy Spirit? Spirit. No, really. I mean, oh man, you know, the Lord's been moving at this in the services, but it just wasn't the same today. I wonder why. I'm just saying, is it possible that sometimes it has something to do with us? That we come in carrying all this stuff and we're refusing to let it go. And maybe even sometimes we're like, ho oh, hum. You know, I mean, this wasn't even really, I mean, the Lord didn't even really kind of move to talk about today. I mean, I would have entered in if the Lord would. What about you, friend? I'm not saying you ever thought that way. I'm just saying, but if you did, I hope you feel it really uncomfortable right now. No, really. I hope the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. You know, I, I didn't really feel And I felt that way before. I didn't really feel it right there. And the Lord probably said, son, well, then why don't you get up? And why don't you praise me? Why don't you give me glory? Hallelujah. Why don't you start something off? Why don't you call on the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Why don't you give me glory? I'm worthy. Praise God. 
And then the Holy Spirit will start moving. He'll start moving in your life. He'll start moving. And, and listen, even if you're not a person that's real vocal in your worship, that's okay. Really, I get that. Not everybody's the same. But I will tell you one thing. This is not an entertainment show. Worship is not an entertainment show. So at the very least, if we're going to reverence and have respect for the Holy Spirit, if we're not a person that, you know, is like Sister Brenda going to walk around the church, hallelujah, and, and, and somebody that gets up and moves around, if we're not like that, it's okay. But could you do me a favor and get in a habit, even if you're sitting down, instead of trying to imagine it like, you know, man, Rich hit some groovy licks on his strings today. Or, boy, Michael was really in the zone. Or, you know, I like that, I like that song that Yvette sang and how she worshiped. Like, instead of all that, how about if we learn to, Father, in the name of Jesus right now, Lord God, as they begin to yes. worship, Lord, yes. I pray that you pour out your spirit, Lord. I see that new person that just walked in through the back yes. door right now. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, I pray that you minister to him, oh, Lord God, because you know what's going on in his life. Oh, Holy Spirit, won't you have your way? See what I'm saying? Yes. Completely yes. different mindset. Yes. Completely different mindset. Learning to grow in yes. spiritual maturity. To believe God because you don't even know what's going on in the lives of the people around you. Yeah. And if we're not reverencing the Holy Spirit, we're taking, we're, we're just taking it for granted. I don't know about you, but I don't want to take his presence for granted. I want to be so thankful for what he's been doing, but I'm so excited to see what he's going to do. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Now, I'm about singers, musicians, you can come up. So I pray, I, I, I kind of tell you some prayers from of a pauper, right? From those that are poor in spirit, those that are humble, amen. But I want to tell you the declaration of a, of a king, talking about talking about just I just used a couple of them. This one here comes out of First Samuel chapter seventeen. First Samuel chapter seventeen. This is the battle of, with Goliath, and I love this story. But look, here's David, young David. He done hop down the rocks. I just I know every time I tell a story, I get caught up in it. Because I imagine it more and more in my mind. He, he's not, I, I really believe this with all my heart. Goliath's over there and he's standing in the valley. Feet are wet in the brook. And he's like, you little dog, come and face me. And here David done hopped down there. He ain't even paying attention to that. He's like looking around. He's a, he's a man of war. He's a teenage boy. He's done killed lions and bears. He knows how to sling a rock. <laughs> And let it find its home. And he's like over here just looking for the right rock. Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, God of glory, ancient of days, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me find that smooth stone. Oh, look at that one right there. Boom. Put that in my bag. Look at that. Oh, look at that. And then I just imagine when it was time, he loaded that rock in there. And I could see him. I can't do it. I can't make it justice. I can imagine him just running. Wow, I'm on the run. <laughs> but before he did that, I would imagine while he was running, this is what he said right here. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Hallelujah! Amen. Declaration of a king before he's even a king. You're going down, sir. The giants in our life are going down. Then he tells Solomon this. He says, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Yes. Prayers of a pauper, humble of spirit, like a child dependent upon their father. Declarations of a king. All the authority, all the power, all the anointing of the kingdom resident on the inside of you. Declaring the will of God. You know one of the things I'm closing with this? And then let's worship the Lord for a little while. Let's be dismissed. We will have Bible study in five. Notice how the boldness of both of these declarations emphasize the glory of God. You hear me? 
that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven. And then the other one, he will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the Lord is completed. It's all about God's glory. It's not about your glory. It's not about my glory. It's all about his glory. And he will be with us to accomplish.